Welcome to the Four Witnesses of the Messiah, Chapter 4, Session 1A, Jesus Christ the Apostle. I'm excited because we now are launching into the meat of Christ's ministry, which contains the parables on the kingdom of heaven, plus his training of the apostles, and the greatest of all his teachings, the Sermon on the Mount. I am believing to do my best to convey to you the splendor of Jesus' teachings so that you can see him through his words. When I worked this material a decade ago, while I wrote my books on the Sermon on the Mount, it changed my life, even after being in the Word for 40 years. His words seen more clearly are that profound and healing And I've realized more since. This is one of the two largest phases, Jesus Christ the Apostle, in Jesus' ministry. These phases are named in Hebrews chapter 3. Please turn to Hebrews chapter 3 and in verse 1, Hebrews 3, 1. Every one of the seven phases of Jesus' ministry are named by one or the other of the apostles. And here, in Hebrews chapter 3, are two of them. Verse 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So... There are two of the titles. Back in John, this now is another turning point in Jesus' ministry in which he shifted into a new gear and the fire hose was turned on. His ministry changed focus at this point when he heard that John the Baptist was put in prison. Reverend Cummins, in his book, The Acceptable Year of the Lord, says that the Gospels are not specific as to exactly when John was put in jail. But Michael Rood points out a clue in the incident at the Pool of Bethesda because Jesus spoke of John the Baptist in the past tense. Look at John chapter 5, verse 35. John chapter 5, verse 35. He was a burning and a shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, Bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. So he was a burning and shining light, you see. So the Sabbath day that John 5 occurred on, because he healed the man on the Sabbath day, could either be the weekly Sabbath, which occurred the day before the Feast of Pentecost, or it could be the Sabbath that was Pentecost, because that's designated as a Sabbath too, where no servile work can be done. So, in 27 AD, these were on May the 31st and June 1st. (laughs) For some reason, I had the impression that the Feast of Pentecost was a week-long feast, like Passover and Tabernacles. But it's only one day. According to the Sadducee interpretation, that day when they did their counting always ended up on a Sunday. Well, maybe since that was the birthday of the church, that's why the Orthodox Church celebrates their holy day on Sunday. (laughs) Whoa, Nelly. But that's another hornet's nest I don't want to stir up tonight. All right. Confucius say, do not beat on hornet's nest with big stick unless you have a big can of bug killer. Well, we're going to have to load up for that one later, so please let me deal with it later and concentrate on the lesson at hand. 
So here is the first event of chapter four, the new phase, Jesus Christ the Apostle, in event number four dot one is John the Baptist put in prison. And we look at that in Matthew chapter four, verse twelve A. Dan Salker also has this and Michael Rood in their chronologies. Matthew four twelve A. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into the prison, then the next one is in Mark one fourteen A. Now after that John was put in prison. So that's event four dot one. So the adversary took out John the Baptist. Uh, it'd be just like that sly snake Herod to arrest John while all the people were busy at Pentecost. But there was a counter punch. You don't mess with believers because you can't do anything against the truth before the truth. And the devil sowed the wind and reaped the whirlwind. Jesus was turned loose. <laughs> and the turning point for Jesus was when John was put in prison. And that's logical, because up till then, Jesus and John had been collaborating, but Jesus was on the increase and John was on the decrease. But now, of necessity, Jesus would need to fill in more. Well, it's the same thing with my ministry. I'm I'm pushing the limit. <laughs> I think it's obvious that I ought to be doing ministry work full time, but it's not worked out yet. I've worked full-time ministry three times in my life, but each time something happened to derail it, which actually wasn't my fault. They mostly were budgeting situations on their part. But I've been determined to finish my assignment anyway. So I've worked full-time secular job and part-time gratis ministry job 60-hour weeks for 25 years, except when I was sick recovering from covid The devil tried to take me out with that, but I survived, and now, man, I'm counter-punching. But if I push too hard and something happens to me, I know that there will be others to rise up and take the work further, and I wouldn't want anything else to happen. Wouldn't want what happened to other ministries happen to the next Reformation Church, and that is that folks would be interested in maintaining the status quo That's happened so often in Christendom with all the other ministries. Well, you know what? That allows the adversary to catch up. He's still in control of the world. He's constantly eroding the cultures of the world until the Lord comes to evict him. Like 2 Thessalonians 2.7, it declares, quote, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way. Well, the adversary's work in the mystery of iniquity, 24-7, and he keeps building counter-arguments against the innovations that the church has found at work in the current conditions of our culture. The front lines of the spiritual battle truly are the ministry of reconciliation. And as technology moves forward and other things, there's new ways to reach people. As our culture devolves, uh, also, because of his attacks, there are different counter-strategies of the church that become effective. So, each generation seems to have different needs, and hence, different methods are needed to reach them. In our lifetime, the church has reached out to World War II heroes, baby boomers, Generation X, millennials, Generation Z, hippies or yuppies or goths or bikers, many other subcultures. And these are all in a state of flux in our society. And each has different interests and situations, but all need Christ, whether they acknowledge it or not. Well, how will we best reach them? It keeps changing. So if a church just tries to maintain, it will fall behind and it'll become less relevant. So, we must keep it dancing, because what might be purple smoke today might be ho-hum a decade from now. (laughs) Victor Werewolf in the former ministry told us guys on the research team to keep going and to build upon what he started. 
Oh, I've done that. What we know now in our 500 hours of classes that have been built upon that foundation and Seven Ones of Original Christianity, that series has the potential to drive great change. And the Old Testament history class has broken new ground as well. Well, it's old ground, but stuff was lost and confused, so we've discovered it. So it's it's new old ground. And now we are advancing into the Gospels. Woohoo! Yeah, a few original doctrinal things have changed, and a lot of practical things have changed as we've pitched out the bad and held fast to that which is good. But we have continued to build. And I want that to go on. But I ain't planning on going anywhere, all right? The Bible basically defines a cultural window as 40 years. Bullinger, in his number and scripture book, teaches that, quote, 40 has long been universally recognized as an important number, both on account of the frequency of its occurrence and the uniformity of its association with a period of probation, trial, and chastisement, unquote. The children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Then Joshua's leadership in the promised land was just about the same. There were several 40-year periods in the book of Judges, and both David and Solomon reigned 40 years. But we can look at those time periods from another standpoint to see the nature or of that trial or probation that's implied. Because the children of Israel experienced an abrupt social and cultural change when they escaped from slavery in Egypt. In chapter 3 of our Old Testament history class, we saw and covered the institution of the pillars of a new society and culture that were legislated from the mountaintop, the giving of the law, the establishment of the priesthood, and the 70 elder Sanhedrin, the new traditions of worship in the tabernacle, and, and even the way food was provided. Each were instrumental in changing them from being slaves to being a people, to being God's people. But, as we've seen over and over throughout history, such radical societal changes usually didn't succeed. And I have to ask, did they succeed for that generation that came out of Egypt in the 40 years that they were in the wilderness? Well, the answer is apparent when we remember how the majority of the spies gave an evil report of the promised land. And who were they talking to? They were talking to the same people who had seen the defeat of the world's most powerful army less than a year before. God told them that because of that unbelief, they would wander in the wilderness 40 years. And everyone... 20 years and upward would ultimately die in the wilderness and only the younger generation would get to enter the promised land. So, there definitely were two different different generations there. The older just couldn't shake off all the vestiges and fears of slavery even as far as they had come while the younger generation embraced the new order and became strong and obedient, and believing. So they were ready to follow Joshua and take the promised land. So, do you see the 40-year trial probation stuff that went on there? Then the next approximately 40-year period, after the War of Conquest, until the elders that overlived Joshua died, was a generational unit as well. But they came to enjoy the luxuries of their land ownership and grew soft. Then the next generation after that lost it, as recorded in the book of Judges. And then in the book of Judges, there were several 40-year periods, usually were initiated by a new judge over a repentant people, until the last 40-year period when they were abused by the Philistines. But do you see the generational nature of that? And then David ruled 40 years. 
He brought prosperity and power to that generation, and they conquered almost all of the land promised to Abraham, from river to river. But then, what happened in Solomon's 40? Despite the great power and riches, Solomon's abuses and sins affected that generation. And at the end, the kingdom split, and they never regained the prominence or world influence that they could have had. Do you see the significance of 40? Wow! Moses was on the mountaintop for 40 days to receive the law and the design of the tabernacle. But at the foot of the mountain, the people fell into idolatry and worshipped the golden calf. Then he went back up for another 40. And that's when he came back down and his face glowed. Wow! The spies were in the promised land 40 days. Various prophets had 40-day periods. And finally, Jesus was tempted 40 days at the beginning of his ministry and then demonstrated his new body for 40 days at the end. Can you see the trial and probation in those 40s too? Well, the first century church had its 40 as well. From Pentecost in 28 AD till 40 years later, 68 when Judea was in the midst of the rebellion against Rome and the zealots had taken over the temple and killed anyone advocating surrender to the Romans. By then, 68, 40 years later, both branches of the church were in ruins. The Gentile Christian church had broken up when Paul was jailed a decade earlier, and now he was dead. Just imagine if he had not gone to Jerusalem. The word had just prevailed in Asia Minor. Well, it would have gone bigger. And Paul could have written 2nd Ephesians or 1st Ephesians 14. Learn more because the great mystery was that big and the riches of Christ that unsearchable. What if he had not gone to Jerusalem? The Jewish Christian church was beginning to come out of its holding pattern with the law and was just starting to begin to recognize Paul's purple smoke, as indicated in 2 Peter 3.15. But by 68, it was too little too late. And in the Jewish revolt, the Jewish Christian church lost its base of operations in Jerusalem. And the Jewish Christian believers had either fled or those who stayed in Jerusalem faced doom. So, had the adversary been working 24-7 on them? As powerful as it was, had the first century church stayed ahead of him? No. Well, we've had our first 40 years in the former ministry, 1942 to 82. Well, how'd that turn out? After that, in the second 40, how'd that turn out? I don't know or care, because I ain't there anymore. I ain't looking back. I'm looking forward. We are in the midst of our own first 40. Well, have we been to the mountaintop? Do our faces glow yet? Have we received enough purple smoke to build our 40? The Apostle Paul, when speaking to the Corinthian church, in 1 Corinthians seven twenty nine, in the midst of the first century church, 40 said the time is short and this stuff is exactly what he meant this is our window to move the word this is our 40 wow where'd that come from back in this new phase in the gospels Jesus was going to let him have it he was going to turn on a fire hose and pour out enough living water and purple smoke to not only change that generation, but change the world. Woo! And this brings us up to the roll-up to the inaugural event for this phase when he taught at his home synagogue in Nazareth. Event 4.2. Jesus leaves Jerusalem for Galilee. So we get the second half of Matthew 4.12, which he just says he departed in Galilee. 
Dan Salker has this in his Gospels Unified, and Michael Root also has it in the Chronological Bible. Then Mark 1.14 also fits with this event 4.2. Jesus came into Galilee. That's all. <laughs> and then also in Luke, Luke chapter 4, verse 14a and verse 15 fits with this. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out fame of him throughout all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, plural, being glorified of all. And so now we arrive at the formal start of this phase when, like all the other phases, there is an announcement. And there are spiritual fireworks that confirm it because it's the fulfillment of prophecy. Event 4.3. Jesus teaches at his home synagogue in Nazareth. Please turn to Luke chapter 4. We'll be in Luke for the rest of the session. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Here it says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. It says, quote, as his custom was. So, this was not the first time that Jesus did the reading at his home synagogue. Now, the reader, this was an honored position. They just didn't give it to anyone. The reader was someone who had been trained in that task. Synagogues had officers, like they also had a sage and a school teacher, usually. We don't exactly know what Jesus' office was there, but, quote, as his manner was, shows that he was in a position of trust there. In modern synagogues, the scripture reading is done with cantillation. That is, it is chanted or sung. That'd be an interesting thing to consider. Did Jesus sing it? Wow. Another detail is that he stood up to read. It was customary for the reader to stand when they read from the scroll and then sit down if they explain anything about it or taught. And he sits down in verse 20. Now, verse 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Now, the attendant is another office in the synagogue, would bring out the scroll from which the scheduled reading was to be made. And because it's a scheduled reading, we can actually date this event. The law and the Psalms and the prophets were divided up into three-year schedules. And that was thought to be initiated by Ezra the scribe. And these readings were then divided into sections called a pericope. Now it's spelled pericope, <laughs> but it's pronounced pericope. All right. And the Isaiah 61 passage was in the second year of the cycle, and it was scheduled around Pentecost. But the record says that Jesus had left Judea after Pentecost and come into Galilee. So this is why I am scheduling this date, this reading for the Sabbath after Pentecost, which would be June the 7th in 27 AD. Now, of course, the reader would have to read Hebrew because that's what the Bible was written in. Now, the REV commentary has an interesting note about this. Quote, the Greek reads, open the scroll. But in the context, the way to open the scroll was to unroll it. The fact that Jesus could unroll the scroll of Isaiah and find the verse that he was looking for is a testament to how well Jesus knew the word. At the time of Jesus... In all three biblical languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek, the Bible was written in all capital letters as one long letter string with no breaks in between the words and no punctuation. The scroll was written in columns, 
and often the letters that ended the bottom of a column were part of a word that continued at the top and start of the next column. Also, the scroll of Isaiah in the Dead Sea Scrolls is about 24 feet long. So Jesus had to know about where in the scroll the lines he was searching for were written. This shows us that by the time Jesus started his ministry, when he was about 30 years old, he had a very good knowledge of the word of God, unquote. And also Isaiah 61, from which he was reading, is almost at the end of Isaiah. So he he had to unroll almost all the scroll to get there. So now we come to this announcement for this phase of Jesus' ministry, Jesus Christ the Apostle. And it even has the word apostello in it. Of course, now, Jesus did not read it in Greek, but in Hebrew, there's an equal term, Strong's number 7971, Shalach, which means to send forth or send a messenger. So here we are, Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath apostello sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And all the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Why? Because Jesus did not finish reading the full pericope for that day. Uh, Michael Rood explains in his Chronological Bible that they had a three-verse rule. The reader had to read at least three verses. Now, of course, the Bible that Jesus read was not separated into verses. That did not happen until about 1,500 years later. But... It's possible that the earlier form of this rule was three sentences. But needless to say, Jesus stopped reading earlier than they all expected. So he had their undivided attention from that point on. But then, Jesus told them something incredible. Look at verse 21. And he began to say to them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He said, this is coming true now. Wow. Uh, Well, up to this point, it was just another Sabbath day and just another worship service at the old synagogue. But then (laughs) everything changed and all the words Jesus had just read refocused in the minds of the people there. And suddenly they realized that he was saying this was about him. I bet you could have heard a pin drop. Instead of him just reading a familiar verse, they were experiencing spiritual history in the making. Not only were they trying to make sense of why Jesus stopped reading, they were also mentally processing the claims he had just made. You see, here was the neighborhood kid that grew up in town. There were rumors that he was illegitimate, that Mary was found pregnant before she and Joseph were officially married. Then, there was the problem with Joseph's decease. Well, if they were so blessed by God, why did that happen? The situation I explained about what happened at the wedding in Cana two months earlier implies that Joseph was no longer alive. So, Jesus was the man of his house. Then there were other rumors about him being the the son of God. Was he having delusions of grandeur? What was he claiming when he said these things? Isaiah 61? That's a messianic and end times prophecy. Jesus, fella, what are you saying? Here's the passage. 
Turn to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, and the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the garment of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And what are they going to do? They're going to build the old wastes. They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. That's millennial kingdom stuff. But you shall be named priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. And you shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. And in their glory shall you boast yourselves. Can you see all the messianic and end times stuff that's there? Can you see why they were staring at him wide-eyed with their mouths open? But what was he saying? He was saying the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. He was declaring he was anointed. He was announcing he was sent. That was incredible to them. His hometown kid, they all knew him. His hometown kid from a strange family. What? He has a spirit upon him? Only the great men and women of God in the Old Testament had the spirit. Was he one of them? And anointed? What? Kings and priests were anointed. High officials were recognized in ornate public ceremonies in this manner. Well, who had anointed him? And when? And then? Sent? As an apostle? What? He's a special emissary from God? Who does this whippersnapper think he is? Well, what are apostles? Apostles are thinkers and innovators. They're often found in the upper leadership circle, but they can function on the intermediate level too. The word apostle is the Greek word apostolos, It comes from the verb apostello. The verb means to send forth as a messenger. Thus, an apostle is a messenger sent forth with a specific message. A third word is apostole, which means the office or position of an apostle, an apostleship. Matthew 10, let's turn there, contains the first usage of apostolos in verse 2, and three occurrences of apostello later in the chapter. By reading this passage, we will see that the twelve apostles were given specifics to communicate and carry out, namely, the light concerning the kingdom of heaven. This is the messenger function of that office. And there are some very significant points in this passage in Matthew 10, about apostles. So Matthew 10, verse 5, These twelve Jesus set forth, apostello, and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, apostles are cultural specific. That is, they're not sent to the world in general, but to a specific group of people in the world. 
go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All right? They go to a specific group because there is no man of God on earth who is to, like being the apostle to the world, except Jesus Christ, he is. And that's his job, be the head of the body after he ascended and sat down to the right hand of God. But also in 2 Corinthians 11, 5 and 12, 11, Paul says he is, quote, not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. So that shows that the top apostles in each culture are equal in stature one with another and that there's no apostle ahead or over them, all right? Except Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ, when he was here on earth, was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That changed when he ascended, before he ascended. He had just told them, go ye and teach all nations, remember? Well, surely no man could have a greater ministry than Jesus Christ. The groups to which apostles are sent are divided along cultural and generational lines. This is further supported by an occurrence of apostole in Galatians. Look at Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, verse 7. But contrarywise, when they saw the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, Paul said, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, Verse 8, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, that's that phrase that means your ministry in the body, the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go to the heathen and they to the circumcision. So Peter, James, and John were the apostles to the Judean culture. Paul and Barnabas and later Timothy were the apostles to the Gentile culture. Now, back in Matthew 10, in verse 7 through 15, it can be easily seen that Instructions were given to the 12 apostles that were specific to Judean culture. Because one needs to be able to communicate on the heart level effectually and motivate people as a apostle. And that can only be done by someone who intimately knows the language and culture. Because remember, the adversary is working 24-7. So this is God's counterpunch, how he works through these emissaries. They're sent. This is why it's imperative to raise up people from other cultures to take the word to their own culture rather than try to utilize foreigners to do all the mission work. They can initiate, but they need to hand it off. They can be somewhat successful, but it's far more effective to believe, to find, and instruct and send people who are already part of that culture. And God helps, because usually the first people you find are the key people. But apostles can be sent to a culture, or if there are significant generational differences, even to subcultures. And we can see the validity of someone being sent to a subculture in the effectiveness of youth ministers today. You see? So, this is why Paul found Timothy, who had a background in both Aramaic and Greek culture. Well, how do you find those key people? We exercise believing that God will reveal them to us, just like he did for Jesus when he found his apostles. So, Matthew chapter 10 goes on to explain more about apostles. Verse 40, Matthew chapter 10, verse 40. He that receiveth you, receiveth me. And he that receiveth me, receiveth him that apostolo sent me. He that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. These verses express that the messenger is to represent the author of the message. 
Jesus Christ certainly spoke for God, represented him. And Jesus was faithful in delivering the message exactly as God gave it. The same is true for apostles that are sent. They are to speak for Christ and deliver his message verbatim. This concept is repeated throughout Matthew 10. For example, Matthew 10, verse 19. But when they deliver you up, take no thought or what you shall speak. For it shall be given to you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaks in you. Verse 24. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. Verse 25. It's enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. These are all lessons to apostles. Verse 27. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what you hear in the ear, that preach upon the housetops. Apostles are sent to different cultures to make known a specific message. The original 12 apostles during the gospel era were to preach about the kingdom of heaven. Paul's task as a messenger was to make known the great mystery as he ought. That's declared in Ephesians six nineteen and 20. So, the Apostles' message does not concern minor topics, but foundational truths to that culture to which he is sent. What they need to know. Ephesians 2.20 reveals that Apostles teach foundational truths. So, the twelve Apostles were given a foundational message. Paul's charge to make known the great mystery is a prime example that the message is something unknown to that culture at that point in time. The twelve apostles also were given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. This understanding opens up a fascinating aspect to the ministry of apostles, which usually is their major focus. This focus of an apostle's ministry can be seen by inspecting some of the other places where apostolos, apostole, and apostello occur. But I want to bring in a very important concept first. Look at Matthew 16. Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, Well, whom do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you, you are Peter, this little grain of sand. But upon this rock, and Jesus is referring to himself, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Verse 19, and I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What power. Peter was called to be an apostle. At this point in the gospel record, he was beginning to exercise his ministry. God was beginning to reveal pivotal things to him. Well, Jesus commended him and reinforced it. Then, Jesus, as his his manner was, gave insight on the topic at hand, which often portrayed it in its greatest extent, that Semitic hyperbole, another Jesus-ism, and he revealed an amazing facet of the ministry of an apostle. In verse 19, apostles are the ones to whom the great keys are revealed. And Luke has more information about these keys. Look at Luke 11. Luke 11. 
verse 49. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, apostelos, and some of them they shall slay and persecute. Verse 52. And Jesus said, Woe unto you lawyers, for you've taken away the keys, the Aramaic is plural, of knowledge. You've not entered in yourselves, and them that were entering in, you hindered. Wow. False ministers teach locks, not keys. They lock away, cover up, hide truths to enslave, control, and bind people and generations and cultures. But true apostles stand against these false ones and reverse their work. And they teach keys, keys to knowledge. Well, what do keys do? They unlock. They open up that which was closed. They disclose that which was a mystery. They set free. Every culture has its strengths and weaknesses. It's constantly being pulled by the forces of good and evil as the adversary works on them 24-7. The good from God tends to liberate. The evil from Satan tends to imprison. God wants us to see what his truth is, but Satan wants to cover it up. The forces of evil work to hide, cover up, lock, and imprison a culture. The apostle is God's messenger to a specific culture or generation who's given the keys they need to fully understand previously hidden doctrine and principles, its application, its reproof when malpracticed, and its correction when it's been covered by error. All of that. The apostle is the fearless one who's at the point of God's phalanx, arrayed against the forces of evil, who reveals, explains, unlocks, and liberates. This is clearly seen in Luke 4.18 when Jesus announces his apostleship. Look at Luke 4.18. Luke 4.18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, the humble, the meek. He hath apostello me, Jesus said, to heal the brokenhearted. That's what apostles do. To preach deliverance to the captives. That's the ministry of an apostle. And recovering of sight to the blind. That's what apostles do. To set at liberty them that are crushed. That's what Jesus did. This verse is the opening of the phase of of Jesus Christ's ministry, for he was the apostle to the Judean culture. And it clearly lists the functions of an apostle to preach, heal, deliver from captivity, recover sight, and liberate. All of these flow from proclaiming the keys to that culture or subculture, which then unlock set people free, heal a people, deliver them from captivity, enable them to see God's light and liberate them from bondage. These traits are confirming the hallmarks of all apostles. They promote healing, true knowledge, deliverance, and freedom. Consider John the Baptist. The world lay in darkness and crusted for hundreds of years after Israel had rejected the prophets of God. His people were enslaved, being bound by the legalism of Phariseeism. God had to send in a spiritual jackhammer to crack it open, and that's who John was. He functioned as an apostle, and that can be clearly seen in his father's prophecy in Luke 1 concerning him. Please turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke 1, 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, 
that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore unto our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, referring to John the Baptist, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. We have seen there, right there, all the effects of an apostolic ministry. Now, earlier, it called him a prophet, but in the Old Testament, the office of a prophet covered more ground. In the New Testament, since the Spirit is poured out upon all flesh, there are many, many more of these. So, it was separated into more categories. The prophet function was separated into prophets, evangelists, and apostles. We can clearly see that the apostle does not just make known previously unknown doctrine, as in verse 77, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people, but also it carries all the way into fruition, as shown in verse 79, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Peace will reign after the obstructions have been fully overcome. And more can be seen regarding John the Baptist's apostleship in the Gospel of John. Look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. We're almost finished here. Verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. So he was an apostle. So apostles make known light to their generation and culture. They uncover things which were previously locked up. Also, each local church in the first century church had an apostle, as seen in 2 Corinthians 8. They were sent forth as representatives by each local church, and they represented each local church as they accompanied Paul in his entourage. And then they functioned as faithful messengers, going back and forth, bringing the knowledge and applications that Paul was teaching. And they brought it back to their local church. So that's recorded in 2 Corinthians 8, 2 Corinthians 8, 22, we have sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. Verse 23, whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you. Or our brethren be inquired of. They are the apostolos of the churches and the glory of Christ. So these guys, the equal to Titus, were other fellow laborers with Paul. And we know their names. They're all throughout the book of Acts and the epistles. So an apostle is to carry a message to his culture which reveals the keys that are needed so they can be freed from what captivates them. They receive and master all the aspects of that message, both doctrinal and practical, and they're responsible to see that it gets carried out. It's committed to them. Since apostles are not sent to the world, this is the major clue 
that the body of Christ is congregational. No ministry needs to feel that they must cover the entire world and glom all over as many believers or fellowships as possible to tell them what to do because they can't succeed at that or be a blessing because they were not designed or called to do that. No genuine leader or ministry of God will be called to a ministry equal to the head of the church, Jesus Christ, and those who try inadvertently stifle growth. Their mission must be to their own culture. If they spawn works in other countries and cultures, These must be self-governing, separate entities, so God's ministers there can work effectually to meet the specific needs of that culture. Therefore, ministries need to recognize and cooperate with each other and share resources toward a common goal of God's word over the world. So, that's apostles. So, back in Luke chapter 4, this was a new phase of Christ's ministry, and he got to speak the rhema, the oracle of God himself, about himself. (laughs) Well, John the Baptist spoke one of them, and the archangel is going to speak another. So here, Jesus decreed it. And the accompanying spiritual firework is, Isaiah prophesied it, and it got fulfilled. Prophecy fulfillment is not a random event. It marks something important. It's a spiritual firework. Verse 22 of Luke chapter 4. We're back in Luke chapter 4 to finish up. And all there at Nazareth bear him witness and wondered at the gracious or pleasing or favorable words which proceeded out of his mouth. But they said, Isn't this Joseph's son? And he said to them, well, you surely say unto me, this proverb, physician, heal yourself. Whatsoever we've heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. Well, they couldn't do it because they didn't believe. Verse 24, and he said, verily I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. That was bold to say, because by this statement, he was telling them, that he also was a prophet. In many cases, I don't recommend broadcasting what your ministries are, because I think that conflicts with the humility necessary to conduct them. I say, show people what your ministry is. Don't just tell them. But now, there are some circumstances that it is proper to let them know. For instance, Paul needed to assert his authority, so... He began his epistles with Paul, an apostle. Another instance, modern thing that we've run into, is when a congregation was spiritually abused by an overbearing, controlling leader, and because of that, everybody under him was second-guessing themselves. And also, they were hogging all the work of the ministries, and you could only do stuff if you had the initials in front of your name. And so, that was exalted when it shouldn't have been. So, it was overbearing, controlling, and everybody else was second rate. Well, in that case, it was good for people to say what they thought their ministries were, because they'd been repressed for so long. So... In either case, if you tell others what your ministry is, just have a good reason to do so, all right? But I think it's better yet to just show them. Well, back in Nazareth, those hometown folks needed a kick in the butt because Jesus didn't do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So he needed to kick them in the butt. And that's what he did in Luke chapter 4, verse 25. Jesus told them, but I tell you the truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land, but to none of them was Elijah sent except to Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. She was a Gentile. 
verse 27, And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except for Naaman the Syrian, a Gentile. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. What? You're saying we're no better than the Gentiles? Because Jesus implied you're not believing any better than them. (laughs) Whoa, Nelly, that took guts. They rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill, whereupon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. Verse 30. But he, passing through the midst of them, went on his way. Jesus just melted into the crowd and they didn't see where he went. Well, that's available. That might come in handy sometime if you need it. So this is the beginning of this phase of Jesus Christ the Apostle. Opening eyes, teaching keys, healing hearts. We are going to witness it from the levels of what it meant to the people then and how it applies to leadership training the apostles, and what it means to us in the church today. We're going to need to make sure our seat belts are securely fastened, and our tray tables are in upright position, because in the next sessions, we are going to be taking off into the blue, or the purple, into the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So bless you.